This is a recording from the Congress to Campus Conference at Reading Bluecoat School on 2nd March 2015. The conference was sponsored by the Eccles Centre for American Studies at the British Library and the British Association for American Studies, with support from the US Embassy London. This session is entitled The US Congress and Effective Legislature, and the speaker is Dr Ross English, with discussion from former members of Congress Claudine Schneider and Dennis Hertel. The title I chose is this, United States Congress and Effective Legislature, question mark. Um, and I chose this for, I like this title because it's a difficult title. And I chose it because it's only is, it's something I've always given to undergraduates and postgraduates to write about in essays and exams. It's, it's regularly been on the rotation. They force you to change your, your exam questions every couple of years. But it's, I set it because it's the one that lets the excellent students really run with it and it lets the good students do some good work on it too. When they're presented with this question, the good students will know something about what's gone on in Congress for the last four, five, six years, maybe further before, and will be able to point out what they see as the successes, what they see as the failures, what they see as the challenges, and then come to some sort of conclusion about whether they said think this shows Congress to be effective or not. The excellent students, though, they take a step back before they do that. And they ask the question at the start of the essay or at the start of the exam, how am I going to judge this? How, what criteria can you use to judge whether Congress or any legislature is effective? What do you need to see Congress doing to say, ah, it's being effective? What do you need them to say it's not doing, for them to say it's ineffective? And so they rather than just jump in and say, well, Congress has failed to do this, has done that, to actually say, well, how do we judge Congress? By what criteria? I hope to see when they write them as essays some sort of acknowledgement that Congress plays different roles. It is, of course, a legislature. It creates legislation. It's the only body in the, in the federal system that can write legislation. All legislation must pass both the House of Representatives and the Senate in order to become law. But that's not its only job. It also has the job of oversight. Its job is to check up on the executive branch to make sure the executive branch, the presidency, is carrying out the laws faithfully to make sure they're not overstepping their constitutional authority. And it also has the job of representation, whether that be representing of the people in the House of Representatives or representing the states, and, and in modern times, by extension, the people of the states in the Senate. And it holds those three roles, to legislate, to oversee, and to represent. And on each of them, how do you judge whether they're being effective? What would it be look like if the Congress is, is it being effective as an overseer of the executive branch? Is it because it's discovering scandal and wrongdoings um, on a regular occasion? Is that being effective? Or if there are no signs of scandals or wrongdoing, is that a sign of Congress doing its oversight job and keeping the executive in check? How do you judge whether Congress represents effectively? How do you judge if a member of Congress represents, uh, represents effectively? Is it because they're popular? Is it because their opinion holds up? Is it because they get re-elected? What about other factors? So these are the sort of things which I want students to start looking at. And in some ways, when I mark these essays, the one that gets the best marks are the ones that never actually come to an answer, you know, and say whether it's effective, but the ones that go through the process of trying to seek that answer. I'm just going to talk about the first of those, the, the legislative. And I'm going to talk about Congress and the extent whether we can see it as an effective legislature, uh, a law-making body. And as, many, as with many of the brilliant essays, I will not come to a, an answer. <laughs> But it's the process which is the important thing. Now, when you look at, if you look at textbooks of the United States Congress, um, and if you go to the library and you pick one up that was written in the 70s, the 80s, or the early, even the early 90s, the picture they paint is one that's going to actually going to be quite out of date. And the, the main reason for that is the nature of parties within Congress. The old textbooks will tell you that within Congress, parties are these broad churches. You get conservative Democrats, liberal Democrats, moderate Democrats. You get conservative Republicans, moderate Republicans, even a few liberal Republicans. And if you plotted them all on the graph of where they sat ideologically, there would be a whole mishmash of Democrats and Republicans in the middle. It would also tell you that what's known as party line votes, that is when most of one party is on one side of an issue and most of one party is on the other side of the issue, uh, would, these textbooks would tell you those things aren't very common. That on most votes you get a mixture of Democrats and Republicans on one side and a mixture of Democrats and Republicans on the other. Both of those things have changed really since the mid-90s. It's become more and more so. 
What you find is that firstly, the parties have grown apart and have become much more homogenous, much more like each other. I'll put the graphic up from, from, Pew, from Pew Research. I'm a tough thing, aren't I? Um, and this is basically where they, the Pew, um, on Pew Research, Pew have plotted every member of the Congress and they've sort of put them um, where they think they stand, consistently liberal, consistently conservative. And they picked out the median, the average median um, member. In 1994, and even in 2004, the, the median Democrat and median Republican were really quite close to each other. And you saw in this middle there are lots of overlappings of Democrats and Republicans. By the time you reach 2014, the parties have moved apart, their average member have moved apart, and there's clear water between the, what the Democrats and what the Republicans, on average, stand for. You also are now seeing party line votes, as in ones where the Democrats are voting one way, or at least most of the Democrats, and all the Republicans, or at least most Republicans, are voting the other way. You're seeing that consistently, and you're seeing it consistently, particularly on big name issues. On the high profile issues, you are seeing the, the voting down party lines much, much more to the point that on the big issues, it's actually, it is actually very common. You're also seeing the disappearance of people in the middle, that there are much fewer centrists, and that's important because the centrists are often where the compromise has taken place. And you're seeing a change within the whole politics, actually compromise is becoming a dirty word. And this is something that's been going on for the last 10 years gradually. In the, in the um, if you followed any of the primary elections, um, the, the ones that take place within each the parties, you'll constantly see, and it's particularly a case when you talk about sort of Tea Party um, on, on the right-hand side of the Republican Party, accusations are thrown against people of having compromised, of having worked on the other side, as reason why you should not vote for them. Compromise is also becoming a dirty word. Now... This has become a problem, and one of the main reasons this has become a problem is that we are now we are in an era where divided government is of the norm. Not just divided government as in one party holding the White House and one party holding Congress, but regularly you're seeing, for instance in the last Congress, the depart each party holding a different bit of Congress. So in the 113th Congress, the last one, we saw the Republicans have a majority in the House of Representatives and the Democrats have a majority in the Senate. Now, when it, all legislation needs to pass both House and both Senate, when you've got a situation where the parties are divided on, on most of the major issues and are unwilling to compromise with each other, well, that's a problem. Because how do you pass a Republican-controlled House and pass stuff through a Democrat-controlled Senate? And the answer has been that, generally, um, it means they haven't. Congress just doesn't pass as many laws as it used to. Um, now, I'm about to show you a graph um, of all the public laws passed by each Congress, but just bear in mind that the vast majority of laws that come under the, uh, which are known as public laws are ceremonial ones. Well, actually, not the vast majority, a, a, a big chunk. Things like renaming post offices, renaming um, highways. So don't think that every law represented on this graph is an important one. But we see here public laws passed by Congress. These are just the acts that go and become, become law. And you can see back in the sort of the, the sort of 70s and 80s, you know, it was not unusual for Congress to be passing 700, 800 laws every two years. This is 1995 to 96, when we get a real drop down, but ever since then it's not really recovered. The 112th Congress, we were shy of 300. The 113th Congress is slightly more, this is the one that's just finished, but still has not hit the 300 mark. Congress finds it hard to pass legislation. And while we might say, well, we've gone up from 112 to 113, will be, actually that bar there is of interest because that bar being up there hides more than it tells you. The 114th, sorry, 113th Congress lasted from January of um, 2013 through to December of 2014, just, just, just as Christmas has gone past. And there was a big event, of course, which happened in 2014, which was the midterm elections in November. Well, the overall figure there is of 296 laws that were passed and became law. 296. Over 100 of them were passed between November and December 2014. By the time of the election in 2014, the Congress had only passed 185 laws. It got up to 296 in the last five weeks of its, of its tenure. Now that's important because it tells us something, and that is, is that 
the, those 100 plus laws were passed after the election. Of course, after the election, the old Congress comes back, so many of the people who come back into Congress have actually been sacked from their jobs, and the new Congress doesn't take part until January. And what it shows is that the, election, the, the pressures of election are actually causing it being a cause of why it's so difficult to pass legislation. Because to be blamed, to, to be seen as being someone who compromised with or worked with the other side, there's a zero-sum game in, in attitude that you can't let your other side gain anything they want because it's a win for them and a defeat for you. In the idea at the moment, there's, in the sort of the way that so many people think, you can't have a situation where both sides win. If they get it, they won. We want it, they have to lose. So it was only after the election, when all the shenanigans of the election took place, that over 100 of these laws got passed. People could work together because there wasn't an election on the horizon. The elections and the electoral competition and the attitudes towards them are having a big effect. Now, that was a, a big problem because you had the House of the Representatives and the Senate controlled by different parties. But as we know, that has now changed. Whoops, hello. And at the moment now, starting the January just gone past, we are entering two years where the Republicans have majorities in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So, if my theory here that what is causing this is a lack of compromise and with divided parties, that's causing the lack of legislation, now we should be in a situation where the Republicans are in a position to actually do stuff, to have a majority, have to have all their people voting on one side of an issue and winning in both the House and the Senate and pushing it through to the President for signature or not. But I think that the problems aren't going to end. And I think we're seeing that already. And the reason is, uh, well, there, there are a couple of reasons. Um, the first, and the, a big one, is the nature of the United States Senate and the fact that within the Senate features something called the filibuster. And I'm sure you've all come across the filibuster. Where an individual, one senator, a group of senators, or say a whole party of senators, if they don't agree with an issue, can obstruct and stop votes happening on, on pieces of legislation. So if they think that a piece of legislation is coming to the Senate and that the, the, the result of the vote on that is not going to be what they want, they can just stop stuff and stop and make sure nothing happens. And that obstruction can only be ended if 60 members of the Senate agree to end that obstruction and end that filibuster. And of course the problem for Republicans is they haven't got 60 votes. So it gives the Democrats the ability, if they want, to essentially, if they can get all their people on side, to stop things happening and not let the votes take place on the things the Republican wants. Now, this has always been, you know, the filibuster is, goes way back. It's not as old as Congress, but it goes way back into the 19th century. But really, until the last sort of 10 years or so, it was something which you wouldn't say, it wasn't rare, but it wasn't common. It would take place when, really, people felt so strongly about it. These days, though, the, the filibuster is becoming a, day, a part of daily life in the United States Senate. It's becoming almost automatic. And while it has risen, the number of filibusters, with every party being in minority or majority, it's particularly risen under the, leadership, the Republican leadership of Mitch McConnell, when he was minority leader. Now, I'm about to show you a graph about filibusters, but I want to explain first. You can't count the number of filibusters. Most of them go on behind closed doors. We don't know how many filibusters take place. But if I want to stop a filibuster by getting 60 senators to agree, I have to file what's called a motion of cloture. We can count those. So we can't count how many filibusters there are, but we can, we can count every time someone tries to stop one. So it gives us a decent idea. And these are the times people try to stop a filibuster. You know, you go back here, even into the sort of 80s, you know, you're barely hitting 50. This was the last Congress. You get essays from students now who tell you that for a piece of legislation to become law, it must get a majority in the House of Representatives and it must get 60 votes in the Senate. You know, that's wrong. That's nonsense. It just needs a majority in the Senate. It needs 60 votes to stop an obstruction. And we're just so used now to thinking that if there's a major piece of legislation where there's any disagreement between the parties and our most major legislation at the moment there is, there will be a filibuster, so you will need 60 votes in order to bring it to the floor. It's got to the point over the last few years of, of what political scientists call absolutely nuts. <laughs> they just, you know, if it's on there's any disagreement, there will be a filibuster. And we wait to see how Harry Reid, um, the Democrat leader, the minority leader now in the Senate, actually starts to do this. Does he do the same thing to McConnell? 
Or does he listen to his own criticism when McConnell was doing it and be, uh, be much more cool? There is another problem, though, and that is in the House of Representatives, where the filibuster doesn't take place, that Speaker of the House John Boehner is finding that actually the job of bringing his troops behind him in favour of things is actually starting to become more problematic. He's got a group of right-wing um, of right-wing Republicans who are starting to cause him problems. These are people who you could call vaguely Tea Party affiliated or part of what's called the Freedom Caucus, it's an official group of, 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 of members of Congress. There aren't that many of them, but they're causing him problems because they are there and they are basically demanding that he sticks to a, a conservative party line on all, on all matters, especially matters that matter to them. Matters that matter to them. And do not want him to have any compromise. They keep, they keep on whispering, talk about coups. And they'll remove him from the, set, from the speakership if he, if he doesn't follow. They won't. That's not going to happen. Mind you, most predictions are made like that end up being completely wrong. He'll be out, out of the job by next week. But no, it's not going to happen. They won't remove him. But they can make enough trouble. What's just been mentioned is the, um, the showdown over the Department of Homeland Security. And I don't know if you've been following this, but if you write anything on Congress, this is a really good case study that's going on at the moment that you can stick into essays to make it look like you're really up to date. Currently, um, the Department of Homeland Security, that body that was set up to keep America safe from terrorists and other things, is about to run out of money. It should have run out of money last Friday. And it needs Congress to fund it, because that's what the jobs Congress does. You pass a law called appropriation, saying that department can have this much money and um, can carry on being funded. The reason why it was going to run out of money this Friday is because of an argument over Obama's immigration action. Because he used executive orders in order to change immigration policy and stop certain people being deported. The Republicans in Congress said that they were going to, the, not only do they disagree with what he did, but they also disagree with how he did it and say that they think he overstepped his authority. But they were going to stop this by defunding, taking away money from anything that Obama wanted to do on immigration in terms of those of the executive orders. And they tied that to the funding of the Department of Homeland Security. Tried to put it through that we will fund Homeland Security but only with these conditions that it defunds what Obama wants. The Democrats said, no, we're not going to pass any bill to fund the Department of Homeland Security with conditions, filibustered it, didn't let it have come to a vote. Time starts ticking, Friday's coming, it's going to run out of money, and it's not politically very good to let the Department of Homeland Security, the thing that's keeping you safe, run out of money and have to shut its doors. It wouldn't completely shut its doors, there is emergency procedures in place. But you can see, politically, it's pretty terrible. So, John Boehner in the House said, we can't let this happen. What I'll do is I'll pass a temporary three-week extension to give us some time to sort it out. The Democrats, mostly to make life difficult for Boehner, said no. But that's okay, he's got a majority in the House, he can still pass this. But 52 members of his own party said no. We'd rather see it shut down if we can't get our way on immigration. We'd rather take it that far than let you do any more. That's the deal. And Boehner was defeated on that vote. Highly embarrassing for him. On Friday, just before it was about to shut down, he managed, with the Democrats' help, to pass a one-week extension to keep it open. That runs out this Friday. Keep your eyes on it. It's still going on. Will they have to shut the doors at DHS or not? But this shows a couple of things. It's, it firstly shows that the problem of what Boehner's got, even though he's got a majority and no filibuster to deal with in the House, you still can't guarantee that he can drag all of his people with him. But it also shows the state of where we've got in the political discourse that, I mean, this isn't the first time the government has been brought either to the edge or actually to partial shutdown over a debate. I mean, you know, two years ago, the government partially shut down because Congress couldn't extend the budget because, um, because the, the Democrats or the Republicans in the House would only pass a resolution to keep funding government if there were changes in health care laws. And it happened before that and before that. It now seems to become perfectly acceptable to actually put the government and shut it down in order to carry on an argument on a particular policy thing. Now, how did we get here? I mean, this, you know, personal opinion, folks, this is crazy. But this is where we've got to in Congress, and this is one of the real problems that's happening. And it's having an effect. I think Andy showed, Andy Moran showed you these figures. You know, Congress is unpopular, and this is one of the reasons. You know, I, the poll I'm using here, they... Um, they, you know, they, their, their, their approval rating is slightly higher than what Andy showed you, depending on poll you're in. But everyone's to be talking about how unpopular President Obama has got over the last few years. You know, Congress would kill for Obama's approval ratings. 
And this, I think, is a real problem. You need the people to have faith in democratic, democratic institutions if democracy is going to work. So, does this mean Congress is becoming ineffective? Well, maybe not, or maybe. The one thing I'd end with is don't judge the United States States Congress or United States government on the same way you would judge Parliament. Parliament is set up in order to, so that the, the, the governing party can get its stuff through. US Constitution was set up to make it difficult that there needs to be agreement between the Senate, between the House, between the Presidents. That if there is not this agreement between the, um, the various bits of government, that nothing, the things won't happen. It was set up so that you know, bad laws would not get passed, because, this is the theory, because they need, so they need to get agreement from different branches. So just because Congress is finding it hard to pass laws, does that mean it's ineffective? What if that law is something you think is a lousy law? Then surely the effective thing is for it not to pass. If there's disagreement between the halves, then surely is the system working properly if it's not passing laws? Do we judge the effectiveness of the system by weighing how many laws they pass? Oh, 500 this year, 300 um, next year, then 500 must be better, but is it? And these are the questions which I think you have to, that, need, that need to get asked. I think there is a problem when it seems there is agreement and nothing can get done. But I, don't, I think these things you need to put through the, sort of the prism of your argument rather than let it drive itself. May I invite our honoured guests to come up and add their two pennies? Let's do questions. Yes? I was, I was thinking that uh, we have these battles all the time and it must seem totally irrational, these battles of the shutdown of government, right? And it's because, and I explain this to, to uh, visitors a lot in our capital, it's because, unlike parliamentary systems, the Congress has the total power of the purse. That is their power. And uh, that's how the Vietnam War ended, because Congress, the Democratic majority, uh, kept trying and trying, and finally the House and the Senate agreed to stop funding for the Vietnam War. And when they stopped it, President Ford then had to remove the troops then, not next month, not six months or next year. He had to remove them then. That's why you see these terrible pictures of the helicopter you know, taking people off the embassy roof. Okay, But that's why these battles keep happening. If, if you're wondering, you know, why do they do that? When, I, when we were in Congress, we kept threatening a shutdown. And we would, you know, the fiscal year was uh, October 1st. We get into Columbus Day, you know, holiday. And we'd be threatening that week, you know, we're going to shut down the government. Once we did for a day, over Columbus Day, and they closed some of the uh, monuments and uh, you know tourist attractions. And, yeah, and nobody really noticed it, you know. Um, but since uh, Speaker Gingrich uh, took over in '94, and they used that, and that was a big battle between him and Clinton. You know, there's still arguments about whether well they could have done better and they could have succeeded, or whether Clinton gained you know his popularity from that battle and all the rest because before that he was low in the polls. So. I guess I'm just trying to add to what the professor was saying. I agree with you. It's uh, uh, you know, a constant uh, thing that we keep seeing going on. Why do they keep doing it over and over and over when it hasn't been working? Any questions? Yes, about that. Uh, Definitely. I think one of the main reasons why there's been so much like disagreement recently is because arguably the Republican Party has moved uh, quite a lot more to the right in recent years. Um, I was wondering why you think that is, why people have elected so many far right Republicans. I don't know if there's anybody up here that can answer that question. Even though I'm a Republican, I'm an extinct part of the party because moderate Republicans have really been squished out. Why is that? Pardon me? Why is that? Why is that? Um, because there has been, actually, rather than pushing us out, there's been more of a movement toward extreme ideology. And I want to make the distinction between ideological beliefs and pragmatic policy implementation. And there is a self-righteous attitude by the, the, the conservatives now that they have all the answers and that, you know, we don't want any foreigners here. We do want everybody to have a gun. 
We um, certainly want to make sure that you know minorities are kept in their place, and a variety of things like that. Um, why is that? I think maybe it's just a societal pendulum swing or something. Um, but there is this fervor that we're seeing around the globe. When you think about the fundamentalists that are showing up all around the world, you know, whether they be Muslim or you know, American conservatives, there is extremism out there. And how do we explain it? I, I have a hard time explaining it because government is to represent the masses, of course, unless it's a dictatorship, but democracies are you know, one person, one vote, freedom of speech. It's everybody's government, of the people, by the people, and for the people. But anymore, you know, the, the ideology of me first and me in power has taken over the, the good of the people. Yeah, I, think, I think Reagan actually did start this as a conservative leader. And unlike Goldwater, who was a failure in his election, and, and other conservatives, he was successful. And uh, I think sometimes we forget that it was his ability to articulate and also his optimism and good humor and personality that made that difference. But still, he created what uh, we're talking about today in the modern world. The other great difference is that, well, conservatives say that Ronald Reagan is, is the altar uh, that they worship. They forget that he passed an immigration bill that dealt with the real issues of immigration. It wasn't, nothing could be perfect, and it wasn't, uh, but he passed it that he uh, passed tax increases because of the deficit, not only tax cuts, but tax increases, the largest in history at that point. Uh, and, you know, and, and different. he did not go to war. President Reagan taught me, and I oppose him on many things, and I respect him for it. You don't go to war unless you have to go to war, uh, unless you're forced to, to protect your country and for the interest of your country. Well, Iraq didn't meet that test, and, and uh, other acts that we take it have not met that test that Ronald Reagan set. You know. so, he taught us a lot of things that conservatives have gotten away from and, and forgotten uh, about, even as they, they talk about him. Why do people then uh, keep electing people more to the right uh, and, and even disagreeing with Reagan's uh, leadership? I think that in the 80s, special interests, whatever you want to call it, big business, corporations, wealthy people, realized that, uh, you know, that they could do more politically uh, with a small amount of money than they'd ever thought before. So since I mentioned before, since George Washington, money's always been important, and money you know, is needed to be successful and win. But they started increasing vastly the amount of money spent. And, and they were able to get results. And I think they were able to uh, uh, articulate that to uh, business and uh, the wealthy community and uh, say, look, you give us the money, we're going to get results, we're going to win. And they've proven it. Now, the other side of that is the Democrats are inept, OK? Because even when they have the money, and as I said before, have the majority, have the presidency, and can raise the money, they still don't know how to spend it. They still don't know how to seize an issue. And when they have an issue that's successful, like being successful in killing bin Laden, Reagan would have talked about that every week. Like saving the auto industry from bankruptcy, because that was a democratic policy and democratic president, saved jobs and the economy. Do they take credit for it? No. Reagan would have talked about that every month. Every, you know, it would have, you know, so the Democrats, even when they have a good issue, can't, can't capture it and do anything with it. So that combination of the Republicans realizing, hey, we can do a lot, if we can raise the money, we know how to spend it. The Democrats being inept uh, on the issues and, uh, and, uh, and their effectiveness in campaigns has made all the difference. I, I completely agree. I'll add a, a couple of other things there. I mean, so that you also going to notice that the, the general sort of realignment of, of in terms of geography since the New Deal and post, that you're seeing really from the 60s through to the 90s, southern states going Republican. And these were where Democrats, conservative Democrats, were, 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 in, were in power. And slowly, either they died off or they switched party. And you saw really where the most conservative part of the country is becoming Republican. And that really was on a pace around about 94 when, when the Republicans get in power. And so the conservative centres of the country are now Republican hands, and that has had an effect of pushing the Republicans to the right, as well as the Democrats solidifying the North East, which is a more liberal area of the country. So that goes on. You also have a lot of grassroots um, efforts that go on from Goldwater in 64 through to Reagan, where a lot of, especially originally the conservative Christian right, were 
getting involved in local Republican parties and trying to drive it more to the right, away from that sort of Eisenhower Republicanism, and that has an effect. And the other thing is things like the Tea Party, not just you know, powered by things like the Koch brothers and that sort of money, but also given a voice by Fox News. I mean, when the Tea Party movement came along, Fox was a cheerleader. Yeah. And that sort of thing, which started to attack moderate Republicans in primaries, give them a voice, give them the money, so that if you're a moderate Republican, we're coming after you, that pushes even the most moderate Republican to look to their right. And the final thing I mentioned is gerrymandering. There are so many districts which are just uncompetitive in the United States that if you want to run, the general election is irrelevant, it's the primary you need to win. And in the primary, you're playing to your base, not to, not to the, the, the central voter. So lots of things are going on, but I think it's a good question. I'm glad you reiterated the role of uh, Fox Television because it reflects my comment about the role of the media. You know, if you're a candidate, the media is the conduit to the voters. And those of you who may not decide you want to run for public office, you may decide you'd like to be part of the media and how critical it is to be well informed as these professors have been sharing with you today how the system works. And then from us, what the reality is in, in the practical world. In the practical world, even though you said, you know, Reagan set this up as a Republican under the Reagan administration, who, you know, I got the president to sign my bills that were environmental bills. The International Treaty on Biodiversity was my bill. President Reagan signed it. Today, if you look at the voting record of Republicans, it is on, on environmental issues, it's zero. Zero. I mean, there is not one Republican with a backbone to stand up for anything that has to do with the environment. Now, to me, that's straight ideology. That has nothing to do with what is practical and, you know, voting on behalf of the, of the masses. No, I, I agree that they've gone against what Reagan uh, taught in so many ways. Uh, but he established that conservatives could win. And it comes down to the fact that, uh, and he was in a minority viewpoint when he was as successful in his elections. Uh, so he showed them different ways of doing things. Because today, if you look at the world, uh, the majority of people are uh, uh, against abortion. I mean, uh, for abortion, for abortion rights. The majority of people uh, would like a fair taxation system. The majority of people are concerned about the environment. I don't know, I don't The majority of people agree with the Democrats on the issues, and yet the Republicans win for all the reasons that have been stated. Uh, it was just that. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Schneider, if your main thing is the environment, as it says in this little biography, then why do you, and you said that no Republicans would support environmental procedures, then why do you so identify ourselves as a Republican? Well, I think these professors have articulated pretty clearly that the party has moved. And I was in office 81 to 91, and at that time there were some Republicans, and even Reagan and George Bush Sr., who were supporting environmental legislation. I mean, um, some of the other things that, that I pushed was the first appliance efficiency standards. And of course, at first, the manufacturers of refrigerators and televisions were opposed to it. Many of them were Republicans. But then I explained to them, look, you either come with me, you're either with me or against me here. But, you know, this is something that the American people deserve. They need to know how much energy they're being, that they're using when they buy a refrigerator or whatever. So could you potentially vote Democrat in 2016? Well, see, this is the thing that I always found interesting when I met my colleagues from the British Parliament, they would say, well, you're a Republican. Don't you always just vote straight Republican? And I said, no, in our country, we vote for what, you know, at least at that time, we would vote for what we think was right. And as Dennis pointed out, you know, oftentimes he voted with Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I would vote with the Democrats. But in the 80s, one of the, the exciting things was that the moderate Republicans, there were 22 of us, and basically we held the power of the Congress. We were referred to as the gypsy moths because we were a pestilence, <laughs> because we could determine which way the bills would go. So what we would do is compromise, build coalitions of Democrats and Republicans, and we would get our legislation through. And even though, you know, Ronald Reagan would call me 
every once in a while or bring me to his office. He brought me there because he knew that I was the type that was an organizer. I could pull the votes together from both sides. And I would tell him straight out, Mr. President, I can't support you on this bill because of this, this, and this. And he would say, well, that's all right, Claudine. I count on your support whenever you feel you can give it to me. He was a kindly old gentleman, you know, and, and yet now, after Newt Gingrich and some of those Republican leaders, it was, if you don't march lockstep with us, you're out of here. They never said that to me because I was out of there before, you know, the 90s. But now, from what I've heard, you know, the Republicans try to keep their people together. And one third of them, as you point out, are the, the Tea Party members. I mean, it's important to remember that, especially environmental issues before the 1980s, it was pretty much bipartisan. Um, that doesn't that mean there were differences, but the differences weren't necessarily on party lines. It was people from auto industry areas, people from farm areas. Um, but you look at something like the massive act, like the Clean Water Act, you know, it passed in 1972 over a veto. You know, and this is an election year. And it, you know, Nixon vetoes it, and it passes over it. General Ford, leader of the Republicans in the House, votes to override the veto. I mean, this is, this is not a partisan issue until the 1990s. Mm -hmm. At the back Excellent. That's a great question because I was on the Science Research and Technology Committee, not a scientist, not an engineer, I was a language major, but I will say that my enthusiasm was to go to every single hearing. So like osmosis, I listened to the expert witnesses, gained a lot of knowledge that way. But when it came to other issues, uh, we had caucuses or clubs in Congress, and there would be briefings on different topics. And one of the caucuses that I started was because when I first got to Congress, the, the buzz was, she's an environmentalist. So I thought, I don't like being put in a box. So I'm going to embrace the business world. And the way that happened was I was sitting beside the CEO of Hewlett Packard at lunch one day, and I was newly elected, and he said, oh boy, I really hate politicians. <laughs> and I said to him, well, why is that? And he said, well, President Reagan asked me to put together what the United States needs to do to be more competitive. I pulled together the best and the brightest from around various businesses. This is John Young speaking from Hewlett Packard, and he said, here we have a roadmap of what the United States needs to do, and it's sitting on some shelf gathering dust. And so I said, well, wait, um, give it to me. I'll figure out how to get some of these bills through, and formed with the Democratic colleague what was called the Competitiveness Caucus. And so in that Competitiveness Caucus, we would bring in experts from the business community, from the uh, pharmaceutical industry, from the defense industry, to brief members of Congress. So that was another way that we got our information. But hearings are, I think, one of the best ways. But now, the latest vote that they had in the House, from what I understand, on my former committee, a couple of years ago, the chairman said, we don't need to hold any hearings before the Science, Research, and Technology Committee because everything you need to know is in the Bible. Now that was scary. Now the recent vote that they had was that there will no longer be allowed expert witnesses to testify from the public domain, only from business. What? How, how, how could the Congress do this? So talk about dysfunction. I, I think that, you know, it's critical that members of Congress have the best information possible. But if the Republican majority now is, is disallowing some of that information, our country will be at an even greater disadvantage. You asking about also secret information, um, uh, special information? 
Well, that's, that's sometimes how they, they talk about themselves, you know. Um, uh, thank goodness this morning so we can have experts come and testify before all the committees and be able, and every, any member can ask for somebody to be a witness, and uh, even the minority, and if they pursue it, they can succeed. Um, but overall, you know, they try to say sometimes, well, they know more, they know the secrets, and they, they can't tell you. Well, my predecessor, uh, Lucian Nedzi, was the first chairman of the uh, House Intelligence Committee. Mm -hmm. After the debacle that we had, you know, in the early 70s, and we, we found out about some of the things our government, CIA, had been doing that were illegal and immoral. So he became chairman of this uh, bipartisan, the only committee that has equal number of Republicans and Democrats on it. And they have private hearings, secret meetings, and all the rest. So when I came to Congress and took this place, I said, I don't know anything about this stuff, you know, and I'm going to be on the Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. and how am I going to learn about all this stuff, you know, in the military and, and the defense and all this stuff? He said, he said, well, he said, you can work hard on the committee, but he said, the most important thing for you to do is read the Washington Post every day before you leave for work. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because eventually every secret will be in the Washington Post. <laughs> this is before Snowden, okay? And he was right. You know, all these years, I still find that, you know, suddenly you hear this big revelation, you know, that's coming out about how the money was misspent or how we violated our own policies and all the rest. So freedom of the press is the most important thing, and there aren't any special secrets. They have secrets for a limited time, but uh, I don't think there's any protected information or special information, and I think it's a rationalization of their policies when they try to say they have special information. I think what, you, what you're referring to is uh, what's known in, in political science as voting cues. And it's, there's a very good book um, uh, by someone called John Kingdon called Congressman's Voting Decisions and talks about exactly how do you vote on something when you have no idea about it. And what we find is that you, you know, members of Congress will have ways of trusting things. There will some committees will have a good reputation that they've done their homework. So if that committee comes out, and especially if the thing comes out unanimously with bipartisan, if you, you, you can pretty much trust they've done their homework. You might, not, you might disagree on the, on the end of the policy, which because you vote against it, but you don't have to question it. You also have members of Congress will have caucuses, colleagues, who they trust. And also, party, party leadership. You know, you'll get people come to the floor, that a vote on, the bell rings, they you know, get down, if you're a senator, you get to ride in a little train, if you're a house, you have to walk. And you get there, and you want people to get to the floor, go up to the party whip, or whoever's in charge, and say, what's the vote on? How are we voting? That does happen. I would like to add something to that. I would never do that, because that's too scary. That's too last minute, and I wouldn't be able to feel comfortable that I knew what I was doing. But how many staff people do, does a, a British parliamentarian have? I'm not very many. Like three or yeah, something? Two, two, so yeah. we had maximum, well, we got a budget. We got a budget, and that budget could be divided any way we wanted, and it was between people who were in our state versus the staff that's in Washington, D.C. So let's say that I had 10 people in Washington, D.C. What I did was I said, you're responsible for all the defense bills, you're responsible for housing and welfare, and you're responsible for energy and environment. And so I would have my staff preempt and know what bills would be coming up in advance, have them review it if I didn't have time to review it, but I would trust my staff more than I would trust one of my colleagues. So, uh, and I don't know, I, I mean, I know that when I was trying to get co-sponsors for my bills and would explain it to certain members, they would say, well, listen, I've got to check with my staff because they wanted to know how will this affect their district if I didn't tell them. And they would want to know, well, what's the leadership want? You know, because they were more inclined to, to go that way. And I always did say that there were, you know, certain sectors of members of Congress. There are people that came to Congress knowing that they wanted to accomplish things. And then there were the people that would go along to get along and follow the leadership. And then there were the people who really didn't know, <laughs> and you could never <laughs> count on them for sure. You'd have to you know, make your case and track them down. And I mean, one time I was doing a hearing and we were having a very important vote on the science <coughs> committee, and I knew that this was controversial for some of my colleagues on the committee, and I had 
eight of my ten staff people in the hearing room, and I said, if any one of these guys gets up to go to the men's room, you follow them into the men's room and then drag them back in time for the vote because we, we're counting these votes. We have to win on this. And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with Claud Claudine. We never talked about this, but there are three groups I've always thought too. Simple. The group that really is informed and really into it and, and, and responsible. Uh, the group uh, on the other extreme that really, about a third again, that doesn't know much at all. Nor are they interested. No. They, they get reelected. They're interested in that, and they might want to take a trip, you know, someplace. But they're they're really not, you know, that into it. But then there's this middle group, and and they kind of move around. You know, yeah. they're informed in some things right. and yeah. other things they're not, <laughs> and all the rest. And the way you describe it is perfect. I've never heard a better description. That's exactly what happens. You know, they're running on to vote. They've got 15 minutes to vote. And it's not like it's a new issue. It's been out for a couple of years if it's made it through several committees and all the rest. But as far as the fine points and as far as that final yes or no, they're talking to their colleagues that they trust. And if you have a really good trusted colleague, like on the A committee, I'm from a city, right, Detroit. So, I, you know, I don't know about the price of beans and all the rest of it, you know. So I'll find somebody, even a Republican, somebody I trust, and he'll say, well, you want to vote no because you're from the city. We've got a heavy subsidy in here. But, you know, we're voting yes, and this is why we're voting yes, you know. He'll, I mean, a really good friend will tell you the exact truth, even though they're on the other side of the issue. Uh, but it's, it happens exactly the way you describe the way it happens. Yeah. Uh, um, Howard Colton, who was born in policy, here, uh, was the build up to the next election, considering the threat of Russia and ISIS, but also considering the fact that there's discontent over intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think foreign policy is going to be more important than ever. And, you know, um, with Hillary Clinton having the experience of being Secretary of State, I would say she has um, an advantage over anybody. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, you, you know, things have changed since 9-11. I mean, before 9-11, even with the Cold War, you know, while people were worried about the foreign policy, the red threat, people voted with, with their pocketbook. You know, it was the economy and, and related issues. 9-11 has, has picked things up, and I'm not entirely sure whether the, you know, the election specialists are, are still settled on this. While people are interested in these things, when it comes to how they vote, what is, what is it? Is it still the economy stupid, for instance? And if you look through elections, actually, for a lot of elections, it still is going. You know, I mean, you know, Obama wins in um, in 2008 because you know the economy blows up, and McCain, um, you know, I'm simplifying here, you know, makes a mess of it. You know, um, is it what what four years later, what wins that for Obama? You know, is it, and I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's you know, I think things are up in the air. And I think you know, in every election, it's always what are you going to do in the, in the future, not what you did. And it's always uh, the economy first. It can, you know, trump everything except an immediate wartime situation or threat. Um, because, it's, you know, we're going to have enough food for our family, we're going to have a job, etc. Does our neighbor have a job? Does that mean I might not have one next month, you know, and on and on and on. And we all feel that way economically about the future and our, our responsibility, you know. But, you know, when there is in the United States today uh, this feeling since 9-11. It's a whole different feeling. You know, uh, before we feared the communists, and that went on for 50 years, we were afraid of the communists, and we were afraid of nuclear war and all the rest, and whether they were going to take another country and all that. But, you know, that was like one step removed, you know. And everybody was used to that, that it was day in, day out, and we continued our lives, and, you know, uh, and Claudia and I grew up under that, you know, so our whole lives. So, you know, it didn't really, didn't keep you up at night. But today, people say, ISIS, they're going to be sending people who've got American passports, they're going to come back here and kill us. And, and, you know, you watch Fox News, or you go to CPAC, the conservative Republican candidates running for president, and that's what they're saying out loud. They're saying communism is nothing. These people are going to come for us now. We shouldn't be afraid right now, today, that this might happen. And it's amazing, you know, how, how this, this emotion is up there like this. Now, they're not worried about the 30,000 people in America that are being killed by domestic firearms. But they are really worried that tomorrow, you know, they're going to have these, uh, these foreign terrorists come to our country. And, and so, it, uh, yeah, it's a different political atmosphere than we've ever had. And once again, remember, fear is a driving force. And the Republicans use it very, very well, much more than the Democrats. Mm -hmm. yeah.
I think you should answer that. So I, you I studied both. I would say it depends on what you mean by effective. I mean, and that's the whole thing. If you're looking for a body that can pass laws, it's the UK. You know, Prime Minister proposes, essentially it's going to get through. Um, but that's not the point of the, the, the US system. To judge the effectiveness of that, I think, is it, you, you, you're comparing things. At the point. It depends how do you judge what is effective. I mean, the, the, if there's a bad law, I mean, um, or something which, take for instance the poll tax in the, um, in the early 90s, something which was widely, unpo widely unpopular, not in that, led, led to you know, the poll tax riots, was dumped, was seen as a millstone around the neck of, of the government, eventually really caused Thatcher to, to go. Now, in any way you measure that, that was not a good policy, you know, politically or popularly, but it passed. It passed because we have our system. Now, is that effective? Something like that, with that controversy, does it get through the United States Congress? Uh, you know, I, you know, I think we filibuster that. Um, so, you know, it, it, Bob Dole, the former leader of the Republicans in the Senate, used to say, you think if you're against something, you want to hope for a bit of gridlock. You know, gridlock can be the system working. And so I don't know if there's an answer to that. Well, I think you're right. Probably the system is far more effective, uh, and it's meant to be from the top down. In the majority, we're going to do this. We're a team, and yeah. we're going to do it. And if you don't, you're out. And if we don't, then we fall. Right? I mean, so and it's clear, and it's and uh, and that's how it's designed. And I think it is far more effective. You know, you hear all the talk about our three branches of government and the checks and balances, and the two houses of Congress, and divided government, and it's all true. Our system is designed. So to slow everything down, to make it difficult to pass a law, to make it difficult to change, is to protect the status quo. So there wouldn't be rampant democracy and the mob in the street, you know, in a change in our nation. That's how it was designed. And that's how it works, frankly, you know. And add to that one other factor, uh, this money we're talking about, and this problem of money and all the rest. And, and yeah, it's true that there's, you know, there's schisms as far as people saying you're not liberal enough or you're not right wing enough and all the rest. But every congressman and woman is elected independently from the party. They raise their money, and they decide how they're going to spend their money, and they decide how they're going to vote when they're in Congress. And nobody can make them do anything, not the president or anybody else. You can offer them, you know, uh, committee, committee assignment, or you can offer them, you know, uh, uh, you know, different things like that. But uh, that's it, you know. They, they can just, you know... Totally for those two years that they're in the House or six years in the Senate, do whatever they want, and some some do. And so that's far different from uh, parliamentary systems. I think there can be an argument that the British system does allow a, a, a the opportunities, it's not always taken, for a coherent raft of policy. So something like if you're dealing with a deficit, the government can make a decision that we are going to cut spending, raise taxes, or whatever combination. Because things are done in the Congress more piecemeal, you do get a situation where you get taxes cut and spending goes up. And that makes it very hard to deal with something like a deficit because, you know, everybody wants to cut taxes, generally, you know, it's a good thing, but nobody wants to cut spending on that little thing. And getting coherence is more difficult within the American system. I think we'll come with one more, so let's go there. And then... Is uh, political apathy a bigger problem in the US as it is in the UK? Is that a bit of a problem in the US as it is in the UK? Apathy. I think that. Um, what do you think? I think it is. I think it is. I think apathy is yeah. a great problem. We have a great problem. One of our problems we're going to talk about is this turnout. And even more important than the spending and more important than gerrymandering is this terrible turnout. You know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, we had uh, almost 90% of the people voting. And today we're down to 20% in these primaries that decide the races. And we're down 30%, 37% for the general election and the off-year election every two years that elect governors and the whole entire House of Representatives. So, you know, it, it's uh, voter apathy, apathy about the issues, uh, everything else. And it, it reminds me of the Churchill quote that we use a lot in our country that's not known, but probably is well known here, that democracy is the worst form of government, you know. Uh, yeah, it's the worst form of government. It's better than a dictatorship. It's better than a plutocracy. It's better, you know, than uh, than a king ruling all the rest. You know, and he's right. Democracy is uh, is cumbersome and uh, hard to get people involved. And you know, like Kennedy said, it's their responsibility in democracy and all the rest. Um, uh, yeah, and so if the citizens are apathetic, 
And it's hard to have effective democracy. And I would say that if I were speaking to an American group of students now, I would have been asking all of you many more questions because what I would want to leave here today with is knowing that you guys understand how the federal government impacts almost every aspect of your lives. I mean, if you're going to get a job and they're shutting down factories and IT centers, et cetera, et cetera, and you don't have any policies that stimulate growth, whether it be shifting the interest rates or whatever it might be, you know, the, those folks in, in the government are impacting your lives. And then, of course, do you want to have to carry financially your mother and your father? Probably not. So if the pension systems or the social security systems are going bankrupt, that's what the, the Congress or the Parliament is focused on. So uh, to be apathetic and say, oh my gosh, these people are a bunch of idiots and all they're doing is fighting and they're just saying no, yeah, that's true. But it's time to throw the bums out. And my dad always said to me, if you don't like the way things are being done, because I always used to complain about my little brother, you know, and he said, hey, if you don't like the way he's doing things, then you do it yourself. And then suddenly I'm looking at the Congress thinking, this is pathetic. And I had been told, if you don't like the way something is being done, do it yourself. So I thought, you know, if not me, then who? And after I was the first woman elected in Congress to a major political office, all the women's organizations wanted to hear from me. So I was doing this speaking tour to, you know, every gathering of women around. And I said, look, if I can do it, you can do it. And I'm happy to report that the following election, we got a female um, attorney general. And then the following year, we got her reelected, me reelected, and we got a female um, secretary of state. And so, you know, we were on a roll. And what was interesting is there was a shift in the culture. And I had many men come up to me and say, well, I've never voted for a woman before, but because you're a woman, I feel you're going to be more honest. Now, I thought that was an interesting commentary. So to eliminate apathy, we have to establish a degree of trust. And how we do that, by sharing information with the voters, by educating the media and getting them to ask the right questions or give the proper background, I think all of those things are critically important to get rid of the apathy because we all have something to lose or we have something to gain. But we're all in this together, no matter what. I would say also that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't equate exactly um, not voting with apathy. Um, because I think you get a lot of people who won't vote because they don't see the point. It's just either Republican or Democrat, or in many districts, yes. it's one of them, you know, to get in. And there's no point, I'm not going to vote. But you ask them about other things, and they're not apathetic. You know, they've gone, they, you know, they sign petitions, they're interested in, in issues. They've gone on marches, they've gone on demonstrations, or just they're engaged with it, but they're just not engaged with voting. And so uh, while the two can, one, they can lead to another, I wouldn't say they're exactly the same. No, but in democracy, I'd say you have no choice. You know, you can't, you can't say that uh, you care about the issues if you don't get involved. Since your government, and, you know, it's not somebody else. You might, you might have to get more people to vote. You might have to work your your head off, you know, to get more people involved and more of a turnout. Yeah. But that's your job. Yeah. No. Whether we're talking about England or the United States, I have, I think we really have to remember, we are a privileged society. I mean, we really are. And I had the good fortune to um, go to be uh, an observer at an election in the Dominican Republic that Jimmy Carter was running. And I could not believe that there were thousands of people in line, probably, I don't know, two miles long, in the hot, hot sun. I mean, it was so hot. People's clothing was just drenched, and they were standing there waiting to get into the voting booth. And when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, think of all the countries around the world where they don't have the opportunity to vote, and think of our so-called developed countries where we have democracy and the opportunity to vote, and we ignore it. We should not. Well, I think that's an excellent place to end. So thank you so much to our guests. Thank you.